Father, thank you for your word. Help us to delve into the glory of what it is that you've given to us today in your word. Thank you for the foundation that we can stand on. Thank you for the hope that it reveals to us. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through the simple writings of common people. I pray that you would open our eyes. I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds. Holy Spirit, I know that you have a message for us today. I pray that you would impress that message down into our souls. Move it into our hearts and minds that we might walk in adherence in obedience to your holy word. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Amen. I want to tell you why I think one of the best holidays on the calendar comes in October. October 31st is one of my favorite days of the year, and it has nothing to do with a pagan holiday called Halloween. It has everything to do with 1517 A.D., October the 31st, a young monk by the name of Martin Luther walked through town, went to the church door at uh, Wittenberg, and he nailed 95 statements for conversation on the wall. It was just like the social network of his day. I mean, if you want to talk about something, you can throw it up on Facebook, okay? Nailing something to the church door was like Facebook. It was, it was what you did when you were going to have a discussion. And so he took 95 thesis, you've probably heard that phrase. He took his 95 thesis, it was 95 statements. We should talk about these things. And he nailed them to the door, thinking, meh, we'll have a little afternoon debate somewhere, and the Reformation exploded. I like, no, I love October 31st, because it is Reformation Day. You can call it any other name you want. October 31st will always be Reformation Day for me. Let's back up just a little bit, though. Where did Martin Luther come from? And I've heard, you know, uh, the accusations that, uh, oh yeah, Martin Luther uh, came up with all of this on his own. He didn't. He stands on the shoulders of great men. All people stand on the shoulders of great men. If you accomplish something, you stand on the shoulders of others. Men, women, I'm not trying to, you know, whatever there, but. So let's just back up a couple hundred years. 1382, John Wycliffe, you've heard of Wycliffe before. John Wycliffe finished translating the Bible into English. A couple years earlier, he'd finished the New Testament, spent another couple years doing the Old Testament and then assembling it all together and putting it and getting it uh, printed. Uh, remember, before the printing press. So, you know, everything is handwritten. So this is, this is no, no small feat. He finishes translating the Bible into English as he tries to call the church back to the authority of the Word of God because he had perceived that the church had drifted away from God's word as the final authority. For where do we learn about God? Where do we learn about God's doctrine of salvation? Where do we learn about the work of Christ? Where do we understand the nature of mankind is? Where do we understand what God is like and what we are like? It comes from God's word. It doesn't come from our own imaginations, although that's where most religion comes from, our own imaginations. So John Wycliffe tried to call the church back to God. His work, by the way, becomes, it was translated finally as the, the Matthews Bible, but it ultimately becomes the foundation for the 1611 King James Bible translation, of which I have a beautiful copy in my office. If you come by, I'll let you look at it sometime. Um, uh, great big, one of the original lookalikes. Oh man, good stuff. Uh, he wrote in the prologue of his 1384 translation, look at this, the Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Does that sound slightly familiar? That's what the Bible is for. His enemies hated him so much that once he was dead, they dug up his body, burned it, and scattered his ashes into the river. Why did they hate him so much? Because he wanted you to have a copy of God's Word. In the early 1400s, another person, he's called uh, kind of the, the morning star of the Reformation, that's Wycliffe, but then we come to another fellow by the name of Jan Hus. By the way, Hus means goose, okay? So that comes important here in just a minute, all right? Uh, so his name is John Goose, right? John Hus, and, and he became something of an adherent to Wycliffe's teachings. He was reading Wycliffe's writings, he was reading Wycliffe's Bible, he was understanding and gaining doctrine from him as he taught, as he ministered, and, and, and he sought, among other things, to bring the church to obeying Scripture rather than tradition. Imagine the audacity of thinking that Scripture should trump tradition. Let me just give you the shortcut. Scripture should trump 
tradition. I'm just, just telling you where it goes. Uh, he was burned at the stake for trying to propagate the word of God. And as he was being burned at the stake, July the 6th, 1418, he proclaimed, today this goose is cooked, but in 100 years a swan will rise, which none will be able to resist. A hundred years later, roughly, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the church door at Castle Wurttemberg. And the reason why that becomes so vital is because the argument for all of these men, and some before them, I could, I could pull out a longer history lesson. Trust me, I wanted to pull out a longer history lesson because I love the history of this. And, uh, but you've got a couple hundred years of, of rapid movement there. And, and I lost my thought. Has that ever happened to you? I just lost my thought. I haven't, so I'm just gonna go right back to where I was on the text here. October 31st, 1517, a monk named, monk named Martin Luther. He was disgusted by the practice of selling indulgences amongst other issues. And the indulgence was basically a letter. John Tetzel would go around and, and he was raising money for St. Peter's Cathedral, Basilica. And, and, and he would say, look, as, as soon as you throw a copper coin into, well, there's, a, there's a, a rhyme, and it works in German as well as in English, when a coin in the copper rings, or when a copper in the kettle rings, a soul from purgatory springs. You know, basically, you can buy your salvations of your loved ones if you just donate to the church. That is not scripture. And, and Martin Luther had, you know, a fit. I'm trying to think of some nice words there, but, you know, this, this idea that you can forgive sin by buying salvation. And so he posted these 95 questions for debate on the door, and, and key to his thinking is that salvation by grace and the authority of the word of God over all other authorities, including the church, and when challenged to recant, this was his declaration. And I was going to write, you know, this was his ringing declaration, but it was kind of spoken with fear and trembling because here's a man who was doing his very best just to be obedient to God no matter the consequences, and the consequences seemed pretty dire. But when his life and soul were threatened, he said this, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they often err and contradict themselves, I am bound by the scriptures that I've quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. If that doesn't fill your heart with chills, you need to read it 40 more times. And understand what was being said at that point. I would rather follow God's word than your dictates. Here's the problem. The church in America is weak. It's lost its way. It's forgotten the gospel. It's forgotten redemption. And it's forgotten the authority of the word of God. And I will fight until my dying breath for the word of God's authority over every Christian. The weakness of the Western church is not new. It's been going on for extremely long time, for centuries. 500 years ago, the Reformation was birthed out of the recognition that the church, over the long term, had grown less holy and more wicked. Folks, I don't think an honest assessment of the, the, the broad Western hemisphere look at the church today would find much difference. There are spots where God's word is upheld. I think this is a spot where God's word is upheld. I'm not, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm not trying to teach you something I don't think you know. But I gotta tell you that it's not too hard to look in the religion pages and find churches so-called with no adherence to scripture or adherence by name only. And it bothers me. It bothers me immensely. And so I want to, over the next couple of weeks, well, five weeks, there's a calendar, I, I want to, over the next five weeks, revisit five phrases that were kind of a rallying cry for the church during the Reformation. And they're all going to begin with this Latin word sola, or solas, which means only, <laughs> okay? And so if, I'm, I'm not going to make you memorize Latin, uh, although, you know, I thought about it, but I never learned Latin, so why should you? So... Sola is a Latin word, it means only or alone. And um, so these, these five sola statements, they are relevant for Christians that are engaging the culture around us because 
If we stand on these, then we'll know where we stand, okay? In a world that doesn't have any place to stand. Remember what Jesus said, those who hear my words and build their lives upon them. It's like somebody who has dug down to the rock and built their house on a nice, firm foundation. But there's others. There's others. They will go off to the sand dunes and build their house there. But when the wind and the waves come, when the difficulties and the trials of life arise, when hardship comes, the foundation of sand swept away and the house is utterly destroyed. But when your house is built upon the rock of the Word of God, when your house is built upon the words of Christ, the wind will come, the storms will rise, the waves will batter, but the house will stand. See, this is why I stand so firmly on the doctrine of sola scriptura, scripture alone, is the final authority for me in all things. Do I read theology? I love reading theology. I love reading theological books. My daughter was making fun of me yesterday because I was holding my little granddaughter and she was fussy and I said, do you want to go read some theology? And she laughed because when my little girl, she's 30, when she was little, <laughs> I would walk around a house reading theology books to her. I was in seminary at the time, you know, so I'm just like, you know, reading and, and to get her to fall asleep. And she says, Dad, it's your fault. If I get tired in church, I blame it on you. Whatever. So, you know, I volunteered to take my granddaughter around, read, read theology to her, but uh, she had other plans. Anyhow, that's another, another story. I love reading theology. I love reading history. I do good history. But if it is contradicted by the Word of God, the Word of God wins. That has to be your heart attitude. It has to be your heart attitude when you hear a lesson from your pastor. If I see something in scriptures that is different, I think we need to talk about it. Because I can't tell you how many times I've come to Scripture with an attitude or thought, an idea, a concept, and after study have had to change my thinking. And if that doesn't happen to you, I want to know why. Because either you're perfect already, or you're not studying the Scriptures. Because they will change you. Well, anyhow, these five Reformation principles, you can see them on the screen there, sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola grace, sola fide, faith alone, sola Christus, Christ alone, and sola deo gloria, all for the glory of God alone. Those five Reformation principles uh, moved the Reformation forward. And, and Reformation is the word. Martin Luther's goal, and many of the others that were alongside of him, the goal was not to split the church. The goal was to fix what was broken, to reform the church. And I think that one more phrase that's not going to be in the sermon series, but a simple reformanda, always reforming. We as Christians must always be reforming. We must always be running back to scriptures and saying, is that really what, is what I think what's really there? Because there's life and death of eternal quality that's on the line when we talk about scripture. We reject it to our own peril. Those five solas provide a foundation for the whole gospel while keeping us firmly within the fence line of the true gospel so that we do not wander off into the unthinking atmosphere of global pluralism, which is what has infected the church today. So really quick, one more time, I'm going to give you the summary and then we'll move in. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, is our supreme and final authority. All other sources are merely assistance to interpreting. When there's disagreement, Scripture wins. Sola gratia, grace alone. It's the means by which every person must be saved. Nobody deserves salvation. Salvation is by grace alone. Sola fide, faith alone, is the means by which we obtain salvation. If grace is the life-giving water, then faith is the hose that brings it to us. It's the pipe, right? Okay? I don't know if that's a very good illustration, but it's the one you're getting. Sola Christus, Christ alone is our Savior. He's our mediator. There is none other. Neither good works, nor human authority, or even moral excellence, being a good person will ever save anyone. And then finally, sola deo gloria. Everything, everything is for God's glory. Scriptures are for God's glory. Christ on the cross was for God's glory. Our faith and redemption is for God's glory. Your automobile is for God's glory. Your bank account is for God's glory. Your body is for God's glory. Your mind is for God's glory. Your life is for God's glory. Your family is for God's glory. Therefore, it behooves us at every level to pursue everything for God's glory. So let's begin. Pastor, I thought we already had. Yeah, no, let's really begin here. In mid-July 2017, um, Eugene Peterson, he's the translator of the message 
Bible, although it's not a, it, it, it's, a tra- it's not a translation, it is a paraphrase. It's a paraphrase, which means, you know, read it, but don't use it for study. It, you know, it's, I think it's fine for reading, gives you a really good feel for a passage, but then, you know, set it aside and go read a real Bible, okay? One that's been translated, one that has uh, adherence to the original languages. Anyhow, <laughs> he became another in a very long line of religious figures that, especially during 2017, just seemed to be boom, 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 boom. And, and he got up and, and he proclaimed his embracing of gay marriage as the right idea. There was massive outcry of people saying, well, what does the Bible teach? And he was forced to publicly backpedal and what to me sounds like a very inauthentic recantation. He says, to clarify, I affirm, affirm the biblical view of marriage, one man, one woman. I affirm a biblical view of everything. Well, I do too. I affirm a biblical view of everything. I'm not sure I know what everything is, but I'm working on it one at a time. But here's the problem. What takes somebody from a position of biblical knowledge to a position that is clearly outside of Scripture? Releasing biblical authority. That's the only thing that can get you there. If we release biblical authority, then we're going to end up believing, thinking, doing things that are outside of God's clearly prescribed, clearly defined description of righteousness. And and you can still see it today. It's been going on for five years now, just defection after defection from the faith. People of high standing or or at least high visibility getting up and and walking away from the faith in a very visible way. And I've I've looked at a lot of these. I I was going to say I studied. I've read a lot of these stories. And I can show you that in almost every single one of them that I'm familiar with, the forerunner to their leaving the faith was the fact that they'd let go of or never held to the authority of Scripture. Folks, the reason I want to preach on the authority of Scripture isn't because this is something you don't know, but it's something you must know. And you must know it not just in your head, but all the way down into your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. It needs to be a part of who you are. So sola scriptura. People are leaving true doctrine because they've already left the Scriptures behind. Let's move on to some of this. I want to give you another small history lesson. Can I do that? As much as anything, the movement away from biblical authority points to what the evangelical church is facing today as a crisis of authority. When I hear somebody who claims to be a Christian departing from historical Christian doctrine, it always begins with a rejection or an ignorance of what biblical authority is. If you set yourself up as the one who decides good and evil or truth and error rather than the word of God, then you are repeating the lie of the serpent in the garden. You are determining what's good and evil, not God. And that was the temptation of Eve. It wasn't do you eat this apple or don't eat this apple, right? It wasn't really about the apple, okay? That's a story that's meant to communicate to us exactly what was happening. It was rejecting, see, maybe news report. News report would be better than story. That's a news report to tell us what was actually happening behind the scenes. It was Eve and Adam choosing to be the arbiter of what's good and evil rather than letting God be the arbiter of what's good and evil. Do we look to his standard or do we choose our own? Well, what does Disney say? Follow your heart. What does Jeremiah say? The heart is deceitfully wicked. (laughs) Who can know it? We need an authority. We need an authority. We need a stake in the ground that gives us a place to look back to and say, well, this is where the scripture goes and therefore that's as far as I go. And that's where I stand. We have one authority in the Word of God. If we leave sola scriptura behind, we lose not only points of doctrine, you lose Jesus, who himself taught and expected sola scriptura. In the early church, it was affirmed by some of the earliest writers, we call them the church fathers, because, it says this, because it is authoritative, scripture determines what the church is to believe. I think it's a pretty strong statement from one of the earliest, earlier Christians. During the Middle Ages, scholars like Thomas Aquinas uh, who, who wrote the Summa Theological, magic, massive dictionary uh, before the printing press, uh, just huge, massive collection of, of writings. This is what he wrote. Theology properly uses the authority of the canonical scriptures as an incontrovertible proof. And the authority of the doctors, or the, the, the scholars in the, the Bible, the authority of the doctors of the church as one that may properly be used, yet merely as probable. For our faith rests upon the revelation made to the apostles and the prophets who wrote the canonical books, not on the revelations, if any such there are, made to other doctors. In other words, just because you think it's a good idea 
we rely on the scriptures rather than your good idea. And theologians have for years tried to come up with statements, and I love theological statements, and I love the creeds, and I use the creeds, and I adhere to the creeds only insofar as those creeds reflect what the scriptures hold. That's why I've, you know, massaged them here and there. By the 16th century, so we're in the 1500s here, by the 1500s, the Roman church had elevated tradition and the teachings of the Pope and the Roman bishops to the level of Scripture. Tradition became recognized as equal to Scripture. Here's the problem. It's observable. Anytime you have Scripture plus something, always, there's no deviation. Always the something becomes more important than Scripture. It just does. It happens over and over and over again. You can see it in for example, the writings of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the little watchtower magazines they give you, those magazines, they think those are Scripture. Written by a team of eight people in New York, they think those are the authority of Scripture. If you read one of those watchtower magazines and you read something in the Scriptures and there's a contradiction, the watchtower magazine wins. This is the way the Jehovah's Witnesses think. If you read the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon is supposed to be on par with, equal to the Scriptures, but it doesn't, in practice, the Church of Mormon raises the Book of Mormon above Scripture. When there is contradiction, the Book of Mormon wins. This is the same for um, uh, Christian science. The writings of, uh, what's her name, Mary Edry, they are above Scripture in authority. Folks, these are the writings of people, and they are flawed, fallible, and beneath the Scriptures. So when we read something in any place, even a commentary that's contradictory of what's clearly in Scripture, back away slowly, and start a bonfire. No, I don't know if you care to start a bonfire. I've got a bunch of those books on my shelves, and the reason I have them on my shelves is because I need to know what they say. But I don't run to them for authority. It is an observable phenomena that any time there is something next to the Scriptures, that something wins. People like John Wycliffe believed so deeply in the authority of Scripture that he dared to translate it out of the Latin and into English. But it was Martin Luther, October the 31st, 1517, who sparked the debate. Today, within the Christian church, as Carl Henry writes, out of the brute force attacks against the scriptures, they are no longer outside the church. Attacks on the scriptures are coming from within the church. This is what he writes. Sola Scriptura means only that only scripture, because it is God's inspired word, is our inerrant, sufficient, and final authority for the church. Let me read that last part. Sola Scriptura means only scripture, because it is God's inspired word, is our inerrant, sufficient, and final authority for the church. Creeds and councils, not to mention the teaching of brilliant scholars in the church for the last 2,000 years, have their place beneath the authority of Scripture. They are judged by Scripture and must be dismissed whenever they depart from Scripture. That's the same thing, even in you know, your, your study Bibles. I love study Bibles. I've got two or three, four of them on my shelf, and yes, I refer to them and I use them. But those notes on the bottom of your page don't have the authority of the words on the top of the page, right? So let's start with really point number one, I guess, you know. 42 minutes into the sermon, and we're on point number one. The Bible is God's inspired word. This is going to be a seven-part sermon. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The Bible is God's inspired word. Let me just give you a couple of passages where the Bible gets to speak for itself. How about 2 Timothy 3.16? All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. It is inspired by God. That word inspired by God is theophanousto. God breathed. God gave us the word. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. Not real prophecy, right? There's fake prophecy, all kinds of stuff. The Enquirer magazine's human will, right? But does that even exist anymore? I don't know. But no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. God is the, the wind behind the sails of the authors of Scripture. When Ezra sat down to write, he was inspired by God to write out of his life experiences, out of his thinking, out of his prayer life, out of his walk with God, out of his knowledge of what the other scriptures have said, so that the Holy Spirit ends up producing for us through Ezra, the book of Ezra, which carries forth exactly what God intended for us to know. Same is true for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all the rest. The Bible is inspired. And to the inspiration of scripture, we must add, we must add the inerrancy of scripture. The Bible is inerrant. It does not make mistakes. Inerrancy is 
what I would call a biblical corollary. It's the consequence of divine inspiration. If God gave it to us, then it must be accurate. Since God is the author of Scripture, the Scriptures bear the imprint of His perfection. Because the Bible does not err, because God does not err. God was there. He understands how these things work. So we have to begin reclaiming the doctrine of sola scriptura by looking first to what the Bible says about itself. We saw just a few of those passages. Scripture is self-authenticating, is another phrase I would use, in that what it says can be demonstrated to be accurate. I mean, you can go into Scripture and find things that are true, and they demonstrate themselves to be true in real life, right? To put it another way, though, Finding evidence in history, archaeology, things like that, finding evidence in history does not make the Bible true. Because the Bible is true, however, you will find evidence in history. There's a big, big distinction, and it's worth taking note of. We find evidence of what the Bible actually teaches, not what people think it teaches, because they may be mistaken in their understanding. Which tells us, by the way, it's a marvelous principle, and we should, we should come to this, um, one of my theological heroes, Francis Schaeffer, uh, would explain it this way. Sometimes, and if you've been in science class, you know what this is like. Sometimes the words of science people will differ from the words of God. When there is a conflict, we don't just ignore the science people, <laughs> you know, uh, but when there is a conflict, we need to understand that one of two things have happened. Either the facts and the data that actually exist have been misinterpreted by those that are saying something about this is what the data says, or, or we have actually misunderstood what the scriptures say. Because this is God's universe. All of the things that are in his book will align with reality because reality was created by him. So there will be no final conflict. If there is a conflict, it's because either our understanding of scripture is wrong or the understanding of the data is wrong. There will ultimately be agreement. And it takes a lot of work to get to that agreement, and sometimes the questions are still going to be hanging out there. I still have questions. They're still hanging out there. But because I know God's Word is authoritative, I'm just waiting to see which side of that line needs to be fixed, my understanding or their understanding, but not the reality. The Word doesn't change. The Bible is inspired, it is inerrant, and it is sufficient. Sola Scriptura declares the Bible is inspired by God and thus it is inerrant. The Bible is sufficient. Sola Scriptura means the Scripture is enough to teach us true doctrine. It is sufficient to save. God's goal in the Scripture is His glory. The Scripture is sufficient for that. God's goal in the Scripture is also your salvation. It is sufficient for that. God's goal in the Scriptures is not your medical condition. He has not promised that your medical condition shouldn't exist. I'll tell you from observation it shouldn't exist. You go back to Genesis 1 and 2, they weren't there, and then all of a sudden Genesis 3, they start appearing. There's a reason for that. It's called sin. Sin is in the world. Death is in the world. Decay is in the world. Destruction is in the world. And it's all as a result of that original sin. So what did God do? He sent Jesus, Jesus to the cross to rectify that problem, and he is coming back to completely eliminate all of that. But in the meantime, my back still hurts. We do not need another tradition or another teaching to discover true doctrine. Let me read to you Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And let's read it slowly, because this is powerful. This is Paul the Apostle. Let's just understand the context. This is Paul the Apostle, who since coming to Christ on the Damascus Road experience, since being baptized as a follower of Jesus, became a teacher of Christ, and began proclaiming the good news of resurrection of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus all over the Roman kingdom, the Roman Empire. He is telling the gospel to everybody. He wants people to be redeemed. This is Paul the Apostle. That tells me how important and dire these words are when he writes them. If even, but if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached to you, he's to be accursed. Cut off from God. As we've said before, so I say it again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. That fills me with fear for the preachers that would say, donate to the church and you can be saved. 
that fills me with fear for the preachers who want to add condition to the gospel. That fills me with fear for every Christian that doesn't understand clearly the gospel. Pastor, why have you been preaching for the last eight, nine weeks on simplicity? Simple things like the gospel. I can do English. I swear I can. It's my first language. Why have you been preaching on that? Because I want to make sure that there's no misunderstanding of the gospel. We can't afford to make, this, to make a mistake. But if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than the one that we've preached to you, he should be accursed. The Muslim religion, their prophet, went up in a cave and says that he met with the angel Gabriel who gave him the Quran. But if an angel from heaven should preach a different gospel, he's to be accursed. I don't really think it was Gabriel. It might have been Jimmy Bob, who was already in rebellion, but it wasn't Gabriel. Do I, be, do I believe it's possible that he met with uh, some spiritual being? Sure. I have no problem with that. But Muhammad wasn't hearing from God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Hey, Timothy, don't forget these things, and that from childhood... You have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith. By the way, what were the sacred writings that Timothy would have grown up with? Genesis through Malachi. He didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John yet. (laughs) He had Genesis through Malachi. That stuff, Tim, is enough to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, there's the rest of the passage, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Not only is the Bible sufficient to give us true doctrine, it is sufficient to lead to our salvation. As Romans 1 asserts, look around the world and comprehend much about what God has said. It is His eternal existence and power are evident, but you cannot learn the gospel by looking at the stars only through looking at the Scripture. So, the sufficiency of Scripture means that all things necessary for salvation and for living the Christian life in obedience to God and for His glory are given to us in the Scriptures. Scripture is inspired, it is inerrant, it is sufficient, and it is the final authority. I would end us there. There are still churches, one in particular, that endorses the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. But they also reject the sufficiency of Scripture and the final authority of Scripture by maintaining that their own traditions are equal. And that their leaders can dictate doctrine that is demonstrably different than Scripture. At which point, my suggestion would be to back away slowly and go towards the Scripture. Doctrines don't change because the times change. That's the great big lie of today. Well, we're living in a whole new world today. Things are not like they used to be back in the old Bible days. We have to to move with the times, change with the times, and be more like the rest of the world around us. Otherwise, we'll never be able to tell people about Jesus. I'm sorry, I would rather be far more like Scripture and tell people about Jesus and find the same results. Because if you fill the church with people who are unrepentant, guess what you have? An unrepentant church. That's not what he's called us to. He's called us to repentance. He's called us to worship. He's called us to proclamation. Does that mean that people who are unrepentant aren't welcome here? That's not at all what that means. But what it means is the church is for Christians to go out and to be the church. The Bible is that final authority. Listen here, in distinctive defiance of the world, the flesh, and the devil, which we read in John's letters is kind of the trifecta that's set against us. My own skin (laughs) wants to sin, you know? The world wants you to sin. And of course, the devil does as well. But in defiance of that, I proclaim that the Word of God is the ultimate and final authority in all that it addresses in Tom Black's life, and the Word of God will be the ultimate and final authority in all that it addresses in First Baptist Church's life. Properly understood, the Word of God will never contradict science, will never contradict reality, and where contradictions seem to appear, both science and Scripture must be tested more precisely to determine the meaning of the facts, but in no sense will the Scriptures err 
The Word of God is inspired by God. It is inerrant because it is inspired by God, and it is sufficient for any and all faith and practice. Indeed, in all that it affirms, the Bible is the final authority for the Christian. I have to go back to Martin Luther's words before the formal inquiry at Worms. It's, if you look at the title in books, it's the Diet of Worms. It's not the Diet of Worms. You get it, the German pronunciation, W is a V, so it's the Diet of Worms. It is the place where they went to put him on trial. And let's just close with his statement again. And I want to note, I want to note the irony of a sermon preached on the authority of God's Word with not nearly enough of God's Word in it. I note the irony, but we have to start with the doctrine before we can move forward, right? Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the Scriptures, number one, or by clear reason, because I don't trust either in the Pope or councils alone, but it is well known that they often err and contradict themselves, I am bound by the Scriptures that I've quoted. And my conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. Thus I stand firmly on the first pillar of the Reformation, sola scriptura, the Word of God, and my feeble attempts to understand all of it. The Word of God is the foundation. It has been teaching me. It has been training me. It has been rebuking me. It has been correcting me for over 30 years now, and I'm grateful for that. And I intend, if God lets me have another 30 years plus, 50, um, to be corrected, rebuked, to trained by the Word of God for the remainder of that time. But whenever the decision comes to pick any other tradition, any other ideas that are contradictory to Scripture, I will stand, rise or fall, on the Word of God. Let that be your heart ideal. Let that be where your faith resides. Let that be where your knowledge resides. Because we only learn about Jesus here. Nothing else will do. Let's pray. Father, I pray for your church. This is your church. It's not my church. This is your church. These people are for Jesus. These people are for you. There are people outside of our doors that are waiting to hear the good news of Christ. We only know what the good news is because your word says it. And in this day and age, God, there is so much temptation to, to get away from the clear authority of Scripture and to just marshmallow our way through. God, I pray that you will give us a steel spine and a firm set of feet to stand on your word and to not back down, to lovingly and graciously share your word and then, Holy Spirit, do your work. Transform the lives that we encounter so that many more might proclaim your glory. This is our prayer in the name of Christ our King. Amen.